Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and let's, uh, let's check this crazy holiday calendar Joe's mom got me. There's got to be something in here. Oh, perfect! It's National Creative Day, which means two things. Today, this show is going to be all in color, and two, we'll welcome the man who talks about helping you live your richest life, Ramit Sadi. In our headlines, Best Buy announced earnings and their results may help you live better. And I'm not talking about buying expensive lighting for your laundry room. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Paul, who's fleeing the country apparently and wants financial advice. Of course, we'll help our friend in need. And then I'll share some deliciously creative trivia. And now, two guys who are to art what Play-Doh is to kids, a great preschool snack, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Happy Wednesday, stackers. We're so happy you're here with us, and we've got a great hour of financial entertainment lined up for you. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table, ready to bring it like usual. It's Mr. OG. How are you this fine morning, my friend? I heard uh, I heard Plato, P L A T O, and I was like, Ah, yes, the philosopher. What does he have to do with children? Huh? I was today years old when I realized the connection between Plato and Plato. I don't think that ever occurred to me. I, is it? What is the connection? There isn't one, but I mean, I wonder if there was a like a deliberate. You just said that you realized the connection. Well, there may Maybe have there been. Was. We don't know. Like philosophy Maybe... and art and the whole thing. Yeah. We don't oh, know we what their do. marketing team was thinking of. I, I, I love that, OG. Doug's like, I mean, I think it was I, very similar. I was simil today years old when I figured out the connection. What's the connection? I don't know. There isn't one. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, they, I don't think they, they had to go too far of a leap. They're like, what is this? This is like dough, though, right? I mean, like it's like, but huh. it's play. But you're going to play with oh, it. Oh, hold on. It's like the philosopher, right? Well, no, man. I was just saying it's like... Now, stick with me. Stick with me on this. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, the... So, yeah. you know, like Socrates. Can we I don't just get it, Plato? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Plato. Yeah, we got to make golf it. tees that have some cool little twist to them, and they're Socrates. And then it's the whole oh, mental philosophy oh, of golf. Boom! Million bucks level. right there. Oh, boy. Yes. We got to trademark that one right now, Doug, so no somebody doesn't steal that amazing idea from us. We got a great show. Speaking of amazing ideas, somebody had the great idea to have her meet Sadie come back down to the basement. Wasn't me, but I'm super happy to claim it because Ramit brings it every time. We always have so much fun when he's on the show. We got a great headline. Uh, I love these case studies when we dive into companies and how companies make money and what can that do to help us? We got Ramit Sadie coming down to the basement, but first this headline, so let's get rolling. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes from uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is written by Jinju Lee, and it is a piece about uh, Best Buy. When's the last time, OG, that you've walked into a Best Buy store? <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, we almost did yesterday, but instead we went to Costco. I was in Which Best is kind Buy. Of the same thing. Last week, but before that, it had been a long time. And I remember listening to a How I Built This episode, uh, Guy Raz interviewing the CEO of Best Buy. They have kind of an offshoot series that they did talking about companies that they brought back. And man, Best Buy continues this string of wins that they've had the last few years. Uh, oh, yeah? Do tell. Jinju Lee writes, Best Buy's pandemic glory days are casting a long shadow, but the company's facing the consequences in stride. The retailer's U.S. same-store sales declined 12.7% year-over-year, and its quarter ended July 30th, slightly better than the 13.2% decline Wall Street was penciling in. Net income shrank by more than half from a year earlier. So their net income shrank by more than half from a year earlier, but was nearly 8% higher than the number analysts expected. So everybody expected things to be bad. It we was... suck worse. We suck better. We suck I mean, less. Yes. We suck less. I can't even do the cheer correctly. 
Investors like what they saw. Best Buy shares rose 4% after the company's earnings call on Tuesday morning. Its shares are down roughly 24% for the year to day, edging out a broad basket of retailers. So, so far, regular earnings report. I'm like, okay, this is neat. Where's this going, Joe? What's going on? I love what uh, Jinju Lee writes next. While there isn't much Best Buy can do about the conditions affecting today's consumer behavior, the company continues to excel at controlling what it can. One metric worth pointing out is its inventory level, which was 5.8% lower last quarter compared with a year earlier. This is a feat no other major retailer has been able to pull off. Walmart and Target each saw inventories rise. 25 and 36% respectively in their latest quarters. Lean inventory should leave Best Buy with far less risk of depressed margins in the quarters ahead. I wanted to bring this up as a case study because how, how that, that's some great writing right there. So often, OG, when it comes to our personal financial situation, we complain about the economy. We complain about the fact that times are bad in America might be a bear market, might be a recession, all these things, Best Buy controls what it can and is doing it better than anybody else that they're competing against. And because that, the stock's on the rise. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if those things are correlated, but, but I, uh, uh, but I do think that that's a good example of trying to do do the right thing, you know, do, do like you said, do the thing that you can do. You know, you can't control what uh, laws are going to be passed. You can't control what tax rates are going to look like, you know, in the future. Heck, you can't control them basically right now either. I mean, so investments, we talk about this from time to time. It's like, well, I got this lump sum. When should I invest it? I'm like, you know, now. I mean, what's is the market open? <laughs> Can you send the money to your account? Can it get invested by nightfall? Like, all of that's a good time. Those are the, you know, when, how do I know when to take the money out? Well, do you need cash in your account? Well, yeah. Well then now would be a good time. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta like try stop trying to play the game of, you know, the best, you know, the, the, just, I don't know. What's, what's that phrase? Best is the enemy of done or something. It's like, Oh, perfect is the enemy of something. Good. Yeah, perfect. Oh my there's, god, I can't believe I've forgotten of this. Of perfect. perfect is the enemy of done. <laughs> yeah, Good. probably. You know, done. I, I what I it's not what I thought you were going to say because um, OG. I, just a couple of episodes. I liked the way you phrased this. I think we were answering a listener uh, question. Say that uh, again, though. But you said something about you. I did something good that. You, you like you just want me to keep you, saying that over and over again? Yes. OG, you said something really good. Yes. Sometime in the last 10 years. I know there was a time, at least once, when you said it. But anyway, no, was, somebody was asking when when did, should they invest? And I just loved how simply you put it, which is when you have the money. And when do I sell? When you need money. I mean, I, that's that takes all of the thinking out of it. Uh, in my brain, this is related. But Joe, you know, when you started reading this article and you talked about how they, you know, their net income was half. But can you go back and, and look how far off were they on their estimates? Does it show or does it talk about how far off they were? Did they oh, meet they, their so estimates? They were positive. Yeah, they beat them. Yeah, but like were they close to what they what they predicted? No, they beat the crap out of it. Net income shrank by more than half, but was nearly 8% higher than the number analysts had expected. That analysts expected, but what probably doesn't say in there, um, and this was kind of an enlightening moment for me when I was listening to an interview, God, a long time ago with a guy who was running SaaS, um, the software out of North Carolina. And he talked about, he refused at that time, he was refusing to go public because what mattered more than performance was to the market was your ability as a company to predict your outcomes to down to almost the penny. And, and, and his thought was, there's only one way to do that, which is you've really got to get creative with now. Here's, we are on an episode talking about creativity. His, his assertion then was you've got to be, have some really creative accounting to be able to hit your estimates that you publish to wall street. You got to hit those estimates within a couple of pennies. And if you don't, even if they're better, if you don't hit your number really close to the number you predicted, 
you know, at, at the beginning of the quarter, you're going to get penalized for that because the analysts really want to know, do you know your numbers and do you know your business so well that you can predict it? And he said, that's no way to run a business. Then I'm just cooking the books. And so at that point, he refused to go public with SaaS. And I thought that was an eye-opening moment to me. It didn't even occur to me that companies were having to do that. And I think it speaks to another reason why you can't try to predict individual stocks and individual results. I, I agree, and it's funny because when we talk about uh, stocks and, and companies being being public, this idea of focusing on quarterly re reports versus long term returns is, you know, ends up being ridiculous. People buy your what you're selling or not based on whether you have a good product, and if you bring it to market, and if you're able to to, to do what you can. I don't want to lose track of though the big point that that, that I want to nail home here. The market stinks right now. And Best Buy is controlling the piece that it can. doesn't control all this other stuff. How many times, OG, have people walked into your office and they want to talk about politics? They want to talk about the stock market and what's going on. They want to talk about all this stuff that's out of their control, right? All this stuff. And Best Buy goes, you know what we're going to do better than Walmart and better than Target? We're going to control inventory levels. We're going to make sure that we have our staffing as lean as we can have because we know the market's down. We're going to have our inventory levels as low as it can be. They are focused specifically on what they can control. They can't control what the consumer does. They can control whether they're best in class or not in a competitive nature. Yeah, circle of influence, circle of control, you know, neither influence nor control. A uh, little uh, seven habits type type stuff right there. I mean, this is true when it comes to your financial planning too. It's like, what do you have? What do you have the ability to pay attention to your spending, your budget, your savings rate, the fact that you're putting money into your investment accounts, um, your asset allocation. That's, I mean, that's kind of sort of about it. Right. And, and, and if you're worried about which, ETF is going to outperform or, you know, the market's down 20%. Should I, you know, maybe, maybe this allocation isn't working for me anymore. You know, that sort of thing. I just saw something the other day that maybe hope provides a little bit of hope and optimism here in the last, I think I'm going to miss the quote, but it's like out of the last 20 times that the market's been down 20%, the next year it's up 33 but most people right now are focused on the minus 20, you know, like, like, you know, we had an okay July, the market rebounded and then August kind of sucked and, and, you know, it's, it's not great, but, but everybody is focused on the minus, the minus 20 right now, but the next year historically is positive. That doesn't, yeah, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? I don't have any idea. And I don't think you should invest based on, Historically, it's going to go up 33%. Right, so right, right. go get a home equity loan and margin the hell out of it. Let's do it. <laughs> you know, YOLO. But um, you can't control that outcome any more than you can control it going down more from here. But what can you do? You can pay attention to your spending. You can, you know, pay off your high interest credit card debt. You can, you know, uh, make sure that you're, uh, make sure that you're building your cash reserve kind of rainy day fund. So... I love the fact that you brought up uh, seven habits of highly effective people. I have another piece here. This one's from leaneast.com, a consulting firm, walking through the seven habits and their habit and their first habit, OG, is exactly what you talked about for people that don't know this, haven't read this. I want to spend just a little time on this Be because proactive. I know these. Wait yes. a minute. Did, you're telling me you guys didn't plan this out, that that wasn't a setup? OG bringing up seven habits and Joe, you happen to have the article. How, how many times, OG, has this it's happened? serendipity, bro. How many times has this happened? This has happened so many times. Uh, number one, and be proactive, is you've got three circles. You've got circle of control, where you focus your efforts on what you can control, your circle of influence, and your circle of concern. And the consultants here say, focus your efforts on circle of control, expand the circle with circle of influence, and avoid focusing on circle of concern. So when they talk about what you can control, just in this piece, it's not even a financial piece, OG, you can control where you live and where you work. You control those, those two things, meaning hmm. you can control what industry you work in, 
which by and large, you can't control exactly how much money you make, but you can certainly affect your cash flow that way. We've also talked about people living in low cost living areas versus living in high cost living areas. You can change those. You don't have to change those. You can still make it, but you control those. What you buy, your budget, what you read, what you put in your mind, what you listen to, what you watch, you control. If you eat healthy foods and exercise, the time you go to bed and get up in the morning, they list. Imagine if you just focus on those things, just how freaking wealthy you'd be. Sorry. You, you know, Joe, have you seen your mom's copy of that book? I mean, she has, she's an amazing copy of that book. I, I can't believe you haven't seen this, that she was given by Stephen Covey personally. And in the back of it, you know, there's always a few blank pages in the back yeah. of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, I don't know what she must have gone to a like a book signing or something, but there were there's a hand drawn secret eighth habit, and it's a fourth circle, and and and, and apparently it was called the circle of service. And so she taught me this that in, and if I wanted to really become successful, I needed to figure out how to like perform acts of good, acts of service. And so she's really helping me with this. I can't believe you haven't seen this. Um, and so. One of the ways that I've been doing that is taking her to get her hair done every week. Sooner or later, oh, it's going to pay dividends. I'm sure it is. But Somebody's, have you not seen that? It's like the secret fourth <laughs> circle of Stephen now, Covey. Now you're going to have all these people, these uh, people that think there's a secret way to get rich, like with, with FOMO, Doug. Like, oh, this is why I've been listening. Finally, they're going to give is? us the secret. Oh, gee, none of this yeah. stuff about focusing on the first thing is important. It's this secret stuff. I can't believe more people don't know about this. No, no, it is good. But the, but, uh, but the I handwriting think... in the back of the book looks suspiciously like your mom's, but she swears it was Stephen Covey's. <laughs> I got to say, I know you're joking, but, but, but having, a, having a service mentality does pay huge dividends. It does. It hasn't for but, me yet. It has for your have, mom, but it hasn't for me. <laughs> might not have made the book. We will link to uh, both of these pieces. Uh, I love this piece on Best Buy and what we can learn from Best Buy. And uh, love the seven habits highly affected people. We'll link to both of those and more. We, of course, have our 201 going out tomorrow <laughs> with deeper dives into these topics. Brooke Miller on our team links to highly curated. Is there? Is, is, is that... Is that a, uh, is that like saying more better? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. What is that? It's like too far. Really? Very good. But really? Very, yeah. Extra unique. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely super stuff. Stackybenjamins.com slash 201. And I know that you can also, if you want to see one first, by the way, uh, just uh, direct message Gertrude from our team and she will send you out an, an issue of it so you can see uh, what the 201 is all about. And I think you're going to love it. All right, coming up next, I know most of you already know this man. If you don't, you're in luck because he brings it every time he's on the show. Ramit Sadie is the author behind the New York Times bestseller, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. It was the first book about money, by the way, that I got my kids. Um, and my son devoured this book. Of course, he started his website as a Stanford undergraduate way back in 2004. He's one of the OGs in personal financial blogging. Now, of course, he has over a million readers a month on his blog, his newsletter. He's got a fairly new podcast. I've been trying to convince him for a long time to get a podcast, and I'm so glad he's now in these waters because uh, he's got such a strong voice. Ramit Sadie coming up next. But before that, Doug, I think you got some trivia about today's holiday, huh? Sure do, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Duggan. Well, here on the sixth most important holiday in September, we're celebrating by bringing you a slice of my world-famous trivia. And because we're friends, today I'll serve it up hot right now. Here we go. Since we're talking about creativity, how about I share one at the intersection of art and commerce? You've heard of van life, right? Hashtag van life. One dude named Vincent currently has an exhibition crisscrossing the world where patrons can bathe in all things Van Gogh life for free. Of course, I'm talking about Vincent Van Gogh, who is considered one of the world's masters. While the proprietors of this exhibition are bathing today in Benjamins, how many paintings did Van Gogh sell while he was alive? 
I'll be back right after I go help Joe's mom with some art. She's saying something about separating the colors so we can run things on hot. Sounds like this one's going to be bigger than Warhol. Hey there, stackers. I'm watercolor lover and unwitting laundry separator, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today, to celebrate National Creative Day, we're diving into the art world. Over 5 million people have attended the Van Gogh immersive experience to date, and because this is such a huge hit, taking a cue from superhero movie creators, the people responsible for this show are now branching out, offering experiences around other artists. But today, we're talking about the man at the center of the current show, Vincent Van Gogh. How many paintings did he sell during his lifetime? so he too could soak in the Dutch version of Benjamin's, whatever those were. He lived before the 100 euro note, so I'm not sure, but I do know this. That guy was so abrasive, he makes OG look like a cute little baby llama. Some say because of his 60 grit personality, Van Gogh only sold one painting during his lifetime. And now, a guy who sold lots of his hit book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich, Ramit Sadie. And here he comes, a guy who I think is getting frequent uh, basement flyer miles. He's here so often. Ramit Sadie joins us again. How are you, man? I am good. Thanks for having me back. It's always a blast. It is a blast. And I got to tell you, this has been something I've been looking forward to all day. I told Cheryl, my spouse, I'm like, I get to mix it up with Ramit again. By the way, I was a guest on another podcast, a wonderful podcast called The Pursuit of Happiness. And he was telling me about this great book that he likes called... I will teach you to be rich. I'm like that book. Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't know. You yes. know what? I have to say it's it's really nice to hear people talking behind my back, but actually saying something nice because you know the internet is the opposite. <laughs> so <laughs> when you hear someone saying something nice, I'm like, wow, that's <laughs> a pleasant surprise. I'll take it. <laughs> if you ever want to know where you where you suck, just go on the internet, and you will find That's out right. very quickly where you suck. That's right. By the way, um, uh, congratulations on your podcast, too. I know you work really hard on that. And I want to open up our discussion today about some of the stuff that you go over in your journal and some of the important concepts there that I think we can dig into by going to an episode of your podcast. And this is the I Will Teach You To Be Rich podcast from July 19th. And um, this is Lisa and Jeff. And, well, let's just listen in to hear what Lisa and Jeff's issue is, shall we? Whole lot more. Now I know what their numbers are. Now I want to ask them about how they talk about money. Listen in. When you talk about money right now, which is never, what's the tenor of those conversations? I will try to bring something up and he, he will aggressively tell me no. Wow. And he will shut me down and turn away and I will be like, okay. I don't know if I agree with that. That it is totally true. <laughs> I usually make jokes. I usually tell you, hey, whatever you want goes. This is a common thing with couples. So here's how it works. I'm just going to break it down. One person, usually the person who <laughs> likes to be in control and is like checking all the apps every day, they see something and they stew over it for hours, days, sometimes weeks. And then something sets them off and it's like this controlled fury like it could be i love you and i care about you but if you answer this question wrong i am going to murder you i'm gonna cut your neck and you're gonna bleed out here on the bathroom floor it's it's right between those two you can't really tell they go so what's this purchase like that it's like a it's a I little guess. it's a little i think what you're referring to it gets a little nitpicky between people i feel bad for them though ramit that they can't even agree on the fact that they disagree like she says well he shuts me down he's like no i don't no i totally don't isn't i make it, isn't it fascinating listening to couples talk about money yeah <laughs> that's that's the reason that i started the podcast is when you and your partner are trying to have a conversation about money. Where do you go? A book might have some tactics, but when my wife and I wanted to talk about money, we wished we could hear other couples. And when I started talking to them, there are couples where one person's an overspender, the other's an underspender. There are couples that they have $13 million 
and they will not spend any of their money and one of them is about to divorce the other. But f I find it most fascinating that couples have developed their own beautiful dynamics in their relationship. And sometimes it works. A lot of times it's not working. That's why they're coming to talk to me. But they all do it. They all have a, a, a relationship groove. In this case with Lisa and Jeff, Jeff had a lot of conscious and unconscious techniques he used to avoid talking about yeah. money at oh, all. Yeah, totally did. He, he would just and make he tried a joke and go away. Yeah. Exactly. So he did the jokes with me. He had a lot of uh, little offhand dad jokes, you know, the PG rated jokes. He would say stuff like, you know, in our relationship, I consider her money, her money, and my money, our money. And I was like, ha, 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 that's, I could see how that's funny, but I'm not really entertained by the attempt at using jokes to distract us. Let's, let's talk. We're here. They went through a lot of work to get on the podcast and talk to me. Let's take this seriously. And when you hear the ways that people talk about money, especially as a third party, as a listener to the podcast, it is so revealing of how you treat money in your relationship. Mm. And to me, that's the beautiful part of it. Whether I agree with them or disagree, whether I'm entertained or not, it teaches me something about myself and it teaches all of us something about how we as human beings relate to money. I just think tactically, Ramit, getting these people to sit down and talk about their budget is just going to be a nightmare to your point because it becomes this picking and back and forth and he tries to avoid it. This is where I think your new journal comes in for I Will Teach You To Be Rich, which is, which is a lot of the concepts in this I want to go through. But I want to start with this one because you have a page early in the book where you talk about bucket list. And I think as I'm listening to this and I'm flipping through your journal, I'm thinking maybe if they start with the bucket list and what these things are, they want to do together. Like maybe this is a healthier way for them to come together with money. <laughs> do you agree with that? Yes. Your instinct is so right. And one of the most common issues that I see when I speak to couples about money is they have no money vision. They will literally go 40 years of marriage one of them is saying, you spend too much at Target. The other one's saying, how could you not pay off the credit card on this date? And they nitpick each other for decades. And when I ask them, what's your rich life? It's like they put on a whole new pair of lenses. Most people have never been asked that question. Certainly in a relationship, it's much easier to live down in the weeds. Target, the dishwasher, did you order the new paper towels? But when you get a chance to elevate and say, what is our rich life? And really take it seriously. And you get to dream for a second. What a gift. Sometimes the gift I give people is just the gift of dreaming, the two of them together, and you can watch the transformation happening in front of you. Well, there's a word that you continually use that I love all the way through the journal, which is design. And I love this idea of design. We have designers on the podcast talking about designing things because I don't think we talk about design and our money enough. And I love this idea of designing your richer life. Thank you. The, the reason that I created the journal was... There's the book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. And if you want to know how to set up a Roth IRA or automate your finances, you should definitely start there. You want to know how to invest and why your active money manager friend is definitely losing money over the long term? Yes, go read chapter six. But once you understand the basics of money, a lot of times people go, okay, I have a retirement account set up. I understand the basics of investing in automation. What's next? And it is rare that people understand how to connect their money to their rich life. It's rare. Most financial advice is about dollars and cents and spreadsheets and Trinity studies and 4% withdrawal rates. Enough. I don't need to talk about that anymore. You read all the fire forums. Come on. And it's so comfortable and easy to stay reading those same forums and same people on social and you wake up every day. Mm, did I learn anything new about my withdrawal rate? Did the interest rate change? How's that gonna affect how much I can take and spend on my toilet paper? No, you won. You won the game. You know your basic numbers. And for some of the fire people, you were really good. You really know your numbers down to the 14th decimal place. Turn the page on your life. Let's go to the next chapter. And that is designing your rich life. I use that term consciously. Because I, 
I studied a lot of design thinking. And when you design something, you design it in a way where you are iterative, it, you're, meaning you don't have to know the perfect vision of your rich life from day one. It unfolds in front of you like a beautiful drawing. You also have to dream. If you're going to design something like designing a house or anything, you want to dream. What do we want this house to be? Who's it for? What would it look like if we had a magic wand? All those same questions apply to your rich life. That is why we design it. It takes time, vision, patience. It changes over time. And ultimately, it's a beautiful thing. You have a sketch early in the journal. Why are we sketching versus just writing out what that dream is? Well, this is a no numbers journal. So for all the financial nerds who want to uh, type in additional cells and create multivariate spreadsheets and pivot tables, don't buy this journal. Damn it, okay? I'm out. You, uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I'm I might have just cut sales on this journal. My <laughs> publishers are not happy right now. Here's what I think. I think that at a certain point, you probably don't need to run another math equation. And, and despite it being comfortable, all the people who love cell C2, cell C2 is so logical, my formula is so dialed in. Ultimately, there's actually something even more meaningful, and that is understanding your vision of a rich life. Remember this, the most important things in life are rarely measurable. You don't measure how long you hug your husband, wife, partner, mom, dad. You don't measure that. You don't measure what it feels like to see your daughter playing her first soccer game. You just love it. And that is the same thing for your rich life. Now, why do we sketch? I learned something a long time ago. Um, I was bringing my parents on uh, a vacation. My wife and I went on a long trip and we wanted to bring both of our parents. It was special to us. That's They're cool. both alive. They're healthy. Yeah, it's, it's important. And so we brought them. And... If you've ever planned a trip for other people, you know that it can go really well or really poorly. And so I wanted to think about what is the experience that we want to create together? What, what are the memories you want to create? And I realized if you just give people everything, it's very easy for people to cross their arms and go, mm, I don't like this or what about that? How about this? It's not working for me. Anyone who has kids, knows what this like. Anyone who has planned a trip knows what that's like. And so my answer to it was, we got to get tactile. Because if you're using your hands for something, then it's very hard to talk about all the things you don't like. How can you if your hand is full of Play-Doh or if you're doing something with cooking? And so with our parents, we did a cooking class together. We went to a farmer's market in Rome. A chef came with us. We bought all these fresh vegetables and then we went and made it with his help. And oh, it was tactile cool. and we just loved it. Same thing with the journal. If you're just writing things, it's great. You should write. There's a lot of writing in the journal, getting it out of your head and, and yeah. dreaming in a way you've never dreamed. But there's nothing like sketching out what your perfect day is. There's nothing like sketching out your dream house. Does it have a chimney? Uh, does it have a long driveway or not? These are things that if you can get tactile, you can find out how meaningful it truly is for you. I think the second you visualize this stuff too, like it becomes much more real. Like to your point, the nerd that wants more spreadsheet, okay, I'm going to have enough money, but I'm not going to have more life because I haven't let myself. And I feel like this, this, this mixture, even if you can't make stick people, well, just the fact of putting stick people on a piece of paper instead of putting 4% rule on a piece of paper makes That's you play. Exactly right. It makes you play more sticky Ramit. I feel like, I feel like there's, well, and you talk about this in the journal, right? There's the math and then there's the behavior and we overestimate the math and we underestimate the behavior. And I feel like your behaviors are much more likely. You're much more likely to stick to your plan. If you visualize it. Th that's absolutely right. And you know, one of the reasons that so many people have read, I will teach you to be rich is that I incorporate my understanding of psychology in it. I studied psychology. My business is like an experimental laboratory. And oftentimes we believe certain things about money that just aren't true. We believe if I have $5,000 more or $50,000 more, I'll finally feel safe. Guess what? Every day on my podcast, I talk to people who have 
50,000 or 500,000 or 5 million more and they still don't feel safe. Why? Because the technical parts of money are important. Yes, you need to have a conscious spending plan. Yes, you should invest. Yes, manage your costs. But the way you feel about money is highly uncorrelated with how much you've got in the bank. And so with this journal, what I'm doing is gently nudging everybody and showing them a different way to treat money. Yeah, you got to know your numbers, of course. There's lots of places you can do that. But what I think is missing and what I've been so excited to do is to show people how to connect their money to their rich life. Okay, you want a beach house, but you can't yet afford it? Cool. Well, let's talk about what you can do right now. Oh my gosh, you want to go on this vacation. Did you know you've been putting it off for four years, but you could actually do it right now. And not just the vacation you used to take when you were 21. You could do a super meaningful vacation in a different way than you've ever traveled. Make it easier for yourself, safer, bigger, more extravagant, more generous. This is the beauty, I think, of using the journal to create your rich life. I like how at the end of the journal, you have people, to put a point on this, write out their obituary. Because I think we spend a lot of time, you know, and, and I want to get into $3 decisions versus $30,000 decisions. That's probably my favorite part of the journal. And I feel like too many people mess it up. But this idea of writing out your obituary, man, when I was doing yeah. that, Ramit, like I'm like, all of a sudden I'm thinking about what's my legacy? Like what's, what, 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 what am I leaving behind? How am I helping my community? Like, boy, all of these big questions that I feel like we don't ask enough. I love that. I'm so glad to hear that you, that connected with you. I think about, I think money and death are inextricably tied. I know it sounds morbid. I don't think it is. I, I don't know. For whatever reason, I've never been afraid to talk about death. I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. Everybody listening, you're going to die. Is that a surprise? Nobody no. gets out of here alive. None of us get yeah. out of here alive. Yeah. You might <laughs> die on this very podcast. Did you Man, know that? You know what's cool? The ratings would be huge. Would be, oh, did you hear that <laughs> podcast where Joe died in the middle of it? Yeah. I don't know if I want to be on that podcast. And okay, so, but you know, I, I remember talking to my parents about it and I said, you know, you've really got to set up all your will and whatever you want to have happen when you pass away. It's just not something that I shy away from because it's, to me, it's just a matter of fact. We are all going to die. Let's plan for it. And I, throughout my whole life, I've always felt very matter of fact about money when I was in my early 20s. Hey, I'm going to get married one day. So let me start saving for an engagement ring and a, an amazing wedding and honeymoon right now. I didn't even know the woman who would later end up being my wife. And I remember sharing that information. It's in chapter nine of my book. And I showed people this crazy calculation, which shows how much you need to be saving as a 21 year old, if you're going to get married or 25 year old or 30 year old. And the numbers are like staggering. For example, if you're 28, you need to be saving about a thousand, uh, oh, 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 like $2,000 a month. Okay. It's mind boggling. Here's the fact. We all have these predictable things in our life. We're probably going to be married. Not everybody, but probably. We're probably going to buy a house and a car. We're probably going to retire and we're definitely going to die. So if you can plan for those things ahead of time, even just thinking about it like you did. What do I want my legacy to be? What's important to me? Boy, you're so far ahead of others and you can sleep well at night. You remind us of your uh, five why technique, um, which I completely forgotten about. And, and then you have a series of, of exercises you have us do, but just as a kickoff for people, I thought it's good to dust this thing off. Cause this is, this I think is a great way to kind of get at the heart of what you're really thinking about with your money and your goals and why you are the way you are. Well, there's a famous exercise uh, from industrial engineering, the five why technique. And, um, you know, it started off with, uh, for example, why did this car come out of the factory with a broken windshield? And it's not about making judgment on anybody. You just get together and you say, why? Well, uh, we missed the QA check at the end, the quality assurance check. Why? Well, because we had too many cars on the line. Why, why, why? And you might discover that it's something completely unrelated. The security guard was late to work because he, his car broke down and therefore everything cascaded from there. So in our money, we can apply the same thing. A lot of times we will say things like, I need to be more strict with my spending, or I know it's bad, but I eat out too much. And 
I find that to be very judgmental and critical of ourselves. And sometimes people are so critical themselves. I just ask them, would you ever talk to me like that? And they're like, no. Like, then why do you talk to yourself like that? So instead we do the five whys technique. Okay. Why did you overspend on blank, blank, blank? Why, why, why? And we discover a few things. Sometimes we discover they actually didn't overspend at all. What does overspending mean? Do you even know? A lot of people are spending more, but they're also making more. Mm -hmm. Guess what? If you make more money, you probably should spend a little bit more. Sometimes we discover that the reason people do something with their money is totally related to their childhood. Just an example, not true for me, but a lot of people um, f remember being taught you have to eat everything on your plate. That was sort of, you know, what was taught in the 80s and before. Yeah. Well, things have changed, but yet that stays with people 40 years later. So you can use the five whys technique almost to point a microscope at yourself and learn why you do the things that you do. Which is fabulous. You have a you have a bunch of exercises then that stem from that technique in the book. I want to flip to that fourth part that I referenced earlier, $3 questions versus $30,000 questions. <laughs> What are some of these $3 questions we're asking way too many of me? Should I switch from Ally Bank to Marcus by Goldman Sachs because my interest rate dropped 0.0002%? Uh, Ramit, what should I do? I go, don't ever send me that email again, ever. The problem is I, for the last decade, I've gotten like 20 of those a day. I'm like, I don't wanna be on this planet anymore if I get these emails. Here's why people do this. They do it because when most of us think about money, we think about what's in front of us. It's like driving a car in the fog. You can see 50 feet ahead of you. So that's what you focus on. And so $3 questions are the things that seem important to us, but they are really in the grand scheme, meaningless. And a rich life is about asking fewer $3 questions and more $30,000 questions. $3 questions are things like, should I switch my bank account to get an extra 0.0003%? And if you actually ran the numbers, it is about $8 a year, sometimes $20 a year. Why are we talking about this? It's not important. Should I get this Amazon rewards credit card because I could make an extra $75 a year? Maybe, maybe you should if you're really into it. But why don't we talk about the bigger questions in life? Do I have automated savings, automated investing? What is my savings rate? What is my asset allocation? Am I paying a financial advisor a percentage AUM? Do I have a job or work that is meaningful to me? Have I partnered with the right person if I choose to be in a relationship? These are 30,000, 300,000, even $3 million questions. And I find in my life, if you get the right five to 10 big wins correct, you never need to worry about lattes, appetizers, or any other $3 questions. You have a worksheet as part of the journal on this, which is list out some of those $3 questions that, hey, just admit to yourself, you're, everybody has some, I have some, you have some, write that down, and then how can we turn this into a $30,000 question? And I love that, just how to list them all, and then how do I flip the switch? Just a, just a, a fantastic exercise. Thank you. The, the, the thing that I want, everybody to get from my material, whether it's the journal, the podcast, book, or my website, is to think bigger. A rich life is not simply a series of small decisions. And that's a very common belief in the financial world, that if we do the small decisions, the big ones take care of themselves. I fundamentally disagree. I know too many people who spend 60 years of their life agonizing over $3, $5 lattes. And in the end of their life, they look back and say, wow, I really, I really restrain myself from buying too many coffees. I go, that's your life? Every day of your life, you just agonized over that? What about focusing on the big wins, the 30,000, the $300,000 questions? You get those right, you never have to think about coffee. And it all comes from a belief that I consider it a tragedy to live a smaller life than you have to. And the journal explains this. It does not mean that you have to spend a ton of money on extravagant things. Although if you want to, I encourage you to. I spend a lot of money on my money dials and I want you to spend money, a lot of money on the things you like. But it means that we are not going to go our entire lives playing defense. I don't, a rich life is not about 
spending your entire life thinking, how little can I spend? A rich life is spent designing your rich life. What's meaningful to me? And then how can I spend more time, more money, bring more people together to do those things? That's what I loved going back to the obituary, my friend. That's what I liked about this. What's, what is my legacy? What am I doing? What the hell am I, what am I, how am I helping my community? How am I helping my family? How am I being this person? Like, and, and, and by the way, if I write all this thing, stuff down for my obituary, but I don't think about it, then I think about it today. How does my life change today on a dime? Because as Tony Robbins famously said a long time ago, the past does not equal the future and you can change it right now and start living a different, a different life. I want to ask you one more big question here, which has a lot to do with exactly what we're talking about. You have a whole section called buy your happiness. And I would just love for the people in our stacker community to hear you explain what the hell does buy your happiness mean? Well, you can use money to buy satisfaction. Certainly you can use it in ways that are not commonly talked about in the financial world. So in the financial world, one of the common things that goes around is this $75,000 study, which by the way, has been wholly misunderstood and it's outdated. Yeah. Um, the idea that after $75,000, basically all your needs are met and you can't be happier. That's not true. The literature shows that experiences make people happy, not to minimize the value of buying things. This is another uh, myth in the financial industry that experiences are good and things are bad. No, a lot of people like things. I like clothes. Some people like cars. It's okay. If that's what you love, if that's your money doll, you want to spend more on it. I totally support that as long as you can afford it. But when it comes to buying happiness, there are so many things we can do that we often never consider. Those would be things like buying convenience. What does that mean specifically? Somebody to come and help you cut vegetables or prep food. Certainly somebody to come if you prefer to have your lawn mowed instead of doing it yourself or clean your apartment or house. It could be help with children in a variety of ways, including a tutor, tennis camp, whatever that may be. There are also experiences like delight. Delight could be uh, calling ahead to a restaurant and asking them to have a cake for your spouse because it's their birthday. It could be ordering an Uber instead of a blank. There are a lot of different things you can do. And vacations, you can travel differently. So this section in the journal shows you different ways that you never thought about using money to buy your happiness and it engages you. So you're not just sitting there reading it passively, you're co-designing your rich life right there in that section. That's what I thought. Like, you know, for me, having my groceries delivered sometimes buys me happiness. I can't stand being at Albertsons. It costs, you know, I, I used to not do that because of the fact that it would, you know, it cost extra and it's not a little bit extra. Instacart can be more expensive, but damn it, it's so yeah. much happier to have that crap show up in my front door. So, so just as an exercise, listen to how this would show up in the journal. I love what you just said. You said, I used to not do it because it costs money, but I hate going to Albertsons and I love having it show up for me. Okay, beautiful. Listen to everybody hear all those different components in there. Number one, I used to not do this thing because it costs money. Most of us, when we go through life, we have a set of eyeglasses on and that is our money lens. We look at the world through these lenses and our primary lens in America is cost. We we scroll right to the right side of the menu. We always ask how much did it cost? It's all about cost. And that was your money lens early on. It was my money lens as well. Some of us are lucky enough to add other lenses to our life. In your case, it was convenience. And sometimes we can just pay problems away. Perfect. So you put on that lens. I love that. Um, anyone who's ever paid for an oil change or paid for a restaurant intuitively understands that there are other money lenses besides cost. What I also love is that if you and I had gone through designing the rich life exercise, I would have said, what's your rich life? We would have talked about, you know, your 10 year bucket list. We would have talked about your rich life week, your perfect day. And I guarantee during that exercise, which all of those are in the journal, you never would have said, Ramit, I love going to Albertsons right. and picking up that rickety cart and pushing it down the bread aisle because I got to get, but then I'm not sure. And they ran out of Topo Chico lime because there's a shortage. Oh, I love it, Ramit. Never. 
and I, I remember very distinctly this couple on my podcast who wouldn't pay for laundry. They wouldn't pay for laundry service. And I said, okay, I'm not going to try to convince you to, to pay for it. It's your money, but let's talk about your rich life. And they told me their rich life was going to the park with their kids and seeing their family, et cetera. I said, where's the laundry? And it just dawned on them. Oh my God. When I start with what I love, then it becomes very easy to decide what to spend more on and what to spend less on. And I think you did an amazing example for all of us in how you got to spending money on grocery delivery. It's it's beautiful the way you put it, actually. Well, what's funny is is that it didn't even start with grocery delivery. It started as you go through the journal, to your point. You realize, I love spending my time talking to you. I love spending my time on the podcast. And I'm like, what can I eliminate to do that more? Well, the grocery visit is what I can eliminate to have more of that. It is, it is fantastic. Uh, it's the I Will Teach You To Be Rich journal available everywhere as of yesterday, my friend which is fantastic. Not only did we meet for the 10 year anniversary of I will teach you to be rich, but now the journal, like it is, yes, it's rolling, you, man. You've been such a, you've been such a good friend to me and you've been so generous in inviting me on this podcast. And I really appreciate it because uh, first of all, it's just fun. I always look forward to the times we get to talk and I love your questions. You, you allow me to share a different perspective on money. And I hope that it connects with some of your readers because as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. And I do believe I could not that tell. the 4% rule no idea. and numbers matter. Yes. They matter, but there's so much more to a rich life than just the numbers. And it's a thrill to get to talk about it with you. Well, last question, I would be remiss to, if I didn't ask you, what's coming up on the podcast? These are podcast listeners, Ramit. What's coming up? Oh my gosh. So, you know, every week, I talk to couples about things that you have never heard real people talking about. It only happens behind closed doors. So imagine couples who are talking about having their f a, a very contentious discussion about signing a prenup, mm. one partner much wealthier than the other. Imagine a couple that is deeply in debt, but they won't admit it. What are they supposed to do? They don't want to change any of their spending. and a couple where one is an overspender and the other refuses to even look at the numbers. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's great radio. Uh, we'll link to it on our show notes page as well as the journal. Great seeing you again, my friend. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Big thanks to Ramit for stopping by. Oh, gee, every time that guy comes to the basement, drops a few nuggets or as a new, I beg your pardon. People say, <laughs> is well, that why the Febreze is always empty in the bathroom? I think we're meat dropping nuggets and you dropping nuggets are two different things, my friend. Yeah. Going back to the Van Gogh exhibit uh, trivia. Have either of you guys, uh, did you go to that? No, I'd love to. It was really fun. I've heard about people going through it for like $15 when we were in, when we were in uh, Dallas, when this thing went through Dallas, Cheryl was all excited, jumped on the train and somehow got it. But it was, it was, I think 45 bucks and it wasn't worth it. It, it yeah. seriously was not, it was very oh, cool. Wow. So if it's a 15 or $20 price point, I would go. Uh, it is really cool to see. And you get, you, you get this great, great uh, feeling for his life and his art. And for a fan of that type of stuff, it's great. But for 45 bucks, no. You walk through three rooms, you sit inside them, and the art kind of moves, and there's music playing. And uh, I could do that on my wall. <laughs> it's sick. Get a good projector. Yeah. Just, it's like, put your face really close to your iPhone. <laughs> put your AirPods in. And then just kind of <laughs> hold it around your head. Play. So immersive. Can I just put Van Gogh on my Oculus? I don't have an Oculus. Alexa, play starry music. There it is. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man, you just got me onto this, but the Finturn has an Oculus. That is something else. I know it's early days of that technology, but it is pretty amazing. You see we have that, videos uh, of uh, being up north, m making grandma and grandpa walk the plank. Oh, no. Which is, uh, which is a, a, a VR game that you get in an elevator and then you, uh, the elevator opens up. And the, the, you know you're forty stories in the air, and you have to walk this plank. And so, is how the, is the copay on their ins on their health insurance? It's just super funny to watch. <laughs> it's just funny to watch while people are like, you know, 
wobbling back and forth on on the carpet, right? They're not on a piece of wood. They're right. But your but this, your your brain is so convinced that you're you get tricked easily. Yeah, I I, I was playing ping pong in the oculus and it's funny because the graphics around it like the room we were in it wasn't that great compared to graphics you see on a playstation or an xbox but you know you kind of don't focus on that and i'm playing ping pong against this really bad looking bot on the other side of the table but i was so into it that i was convinced i was playing ping pong and i lost a point and like you would in regular ping pong, I went to lean down on the table like I was exasperated and ticked off and went right to the floor. Oh, nice. <laughs> Didn't quite, you know, face plant, but I was sure that that was a real table and it was going to support me. So that's I don't, I, maybe that's what they're trying to do with the Van Gogh exhibit. I don't know. But uh, the Oculus thing, that's, that's where it is. That's where it's going. Fidelity at FinCon one year, and we reported on this on the show, uh, this is maybe three years ago, had uh, Oculus and had, it looked like a golf course set up, and you would put in by spinning this big wheel that looked like that huge wheel on the wheel of, not Wheel of Fortune, the one on uh, The Price is Right, where you pull it down. Oh, yeah. And you pull down how much money you're saving, literally with your hands, and then you'd pull down the year that you want to retire, and it would show you... It would move you along the golf course, showing like how close you are and then what you have to do next. And they were wondering, the great brains at Fidelity were wondering, like, can this help people kind of get it? Like, oh, if I save a little more money, where am I going to be? A bunch of if-then scenarios. There are some really interesting, more corporate, non-gamey applications of that technology. I was doing some consulting for a really large uh, healthcare provider, and they used that immersive technology for training doctors. Uh, in as they went to bi- visit uh, their patients in a hospital, teaching them how to pay attention to all of the other stuff that's around them that may be clues to their patient's health other than the patient themselves. And they had family members in there and, and lots of other stuff. I love and, it. And it was really, really, a, like, I never would have thought of that. That was, that was cool. It was so great. We're hey, so spe- deep into a hole here that has nothing to do with this show. <laughs> well, then why don't we throw out David Lifeline? And tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. Oh, man. Um, Real ping pong tables? Yeah, yeah. I think if, yeah, I think if there was any way we could create a game that was like physical that you could touch that wouldn't hurt your face (laughs) when things went wrong. Yeah. Imagine if we could use like a real table, real and some wood real in this virtual mallets. world. It says yeah. virtual stuff. Oh, that would be. I think that game might sell. People might know what that was. But it's, Joe, you uh, know what has been done really well virtually? Haven oh Life. Oh yes, absolutely. See what you I did know, there? You know why, Doug? <laughs> Tell me why, it's, Joe. It's because their application is simple. It's online. You get instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. All policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old. And today we're going to throw out the lifeline to my new friend, Paul, but not before I say that you should head to stackingbenjamins.com slash Haven Life now to get your free quote. Let's get our life insurance done, people. Hey, Paul, how you doing, man? Hey there, Joe, G and Doug. This is Paul from Utah. So I have been pr- aggressively pursuing financial independence, uh, and I'm fortunate that I have access to 401A, 403B, 457B, and HSA accounts. And I've been funding those, uh, not maxing all of them, but doing what I can. And I've also been uh, purchasing some rental real estate the last couple of years and hope to purchase a little bit more than I currently hold. Uh, 33 now and expect to be finan- comfortably financially independent by 40. Shortly thereafter, I hope to become an expat. I know I'm not supposed to learn anything from you guys, but wondering uh, if you know or have any direction of where to learn about accessing these accounts as an expat and probably uh, before normal retirement age. If there's any specific resources or tips to start learning about that so that when the time comes, I'm ready and don't have any surprises. Thanks for all you do. Love the show. Hey, thanks for that, Paul. And by the way, congratulations on aggressively pursuing financial independence. I don't know why he's got to flee the country, OG. So as soon as I get this done, I'm going to leave. Not sure what's going on there, Paul. Can't but, tell you where uh, I'm headed, but I can tell you it's a non-extradition country. 
<laughs> How do we help him? What does he do to get that all these accounts with fours in them? So I have a couple of uh, uh, caveats, and that is, if you're thinking about this, what Paul's doing is the right way to consider it, which is years in advance, because uh, this is not as easy as you think. Every uh, investment company, whether it's Fidelity or Schwab or Vanguard or whatever, have their own rules around how they're going to service U.S. citizens who don't live in the country. And we've heard lots of horror stories about people who, you know, just say, well, I'm just, you, you know, I'm just going to go live overseas, you know, and do whatever. The technology department at these companies figure out where you're logging into your accounts from and go, well, hey, Paul logged into his account for every Thursday for six straight months in Singapore. We don't do business in Singapore. He must be in Singapore and we're closing your account. No notice, no investigation, no, hey, by the way, just here's a check. We're sorry about all the taxes. So uh, so you really have to be careful about this stuff in advance because uh, because they, you know, they're real serious about their liability. You know, they're not going to do business in countries where they're not able to do business and they're not going to risk their their business model and fines from countries and, you know, the equivalent of the Singaporean SEC. I'm just making it up. But you know, because, because Paul wants to live there. So you have to know this stuff long in advance and, and the, and the penalty for trying to get around it, they will, they will figure, figure it out. You know, it's like, well, I'll just use a VPN. Yeah. They, they figure that out. You know, I'll just use a, I'll just use a mailboxes, et cetera, you know, you know, like a post office box for my mail. Yeah. You can't do that. <laughs> like they know what those, all of those addresses are. You have to have a residence address. So there's more to it than just, I'm going to take my you know, ball and bat and go to another country and live out my days. That being said, the other thing that I would think about is starting that other bucket of money. So you've got all this qualified retirement account money. What about stuff that's not retirement? What about regular brokerage account money? You know, you can access your retirement accounts if you're retired prior to age 59 and a half. There's no problem with that, but you have to follow a lot of different rules. You can only take out certain amounts. You have to tell the government in advance how much you're going to do and all this other sort of stuff, which is fine if you know that stuff. If you're planning on retiring 20 years earlier than, quote unquote, normal retirement, there's a lot that can happen in 20 years. I mean, just look at the last 20 years of Paul's life, going from 20 to 40, he managed to save all this money or planning on saving all this money getting toward retirement. So um, so I would be using the next five or six or seven years to, to uh, build that bucket that's outside of retirement accounts, thinking about the custodian issues of where to have the money. And then secondly, figuring out where to save your money now to give you the most flexibility would be the things that I would, I would spend a lot of energy on right now. Um, and depending on where you want to go, it may not be a big deal. You know, it's like I'm going to go live in London. Okay. Lots of places do business with folks in, uh, in London. So you'd be fine. You know, I want to go live in, you know, Iran you're probably going to run into some troubles <laughs> that there's anything wrong with the Iranian people, but the government and the U S government do not get along well together. So, you know, there's going to be a lot bigger issues there. Anyways, uh, all, all in all, I think the three of us are pretty jealous that, uh, a <laughs> you're planning on retiring at 40 and B you're going to go do so in some, you know, nice tropical Island somewhere where there's uh, no extradition, um, that could come in handy. So I'm glad you figured that out, Paul. Hope he has a guest room. But I know, Joe, we've got a, a resource for him. We do. Uh, for people that are wondering about this, there's a gentleman named uh, uh, Travis Scott Luther who writes a bunch about uh, his time living and working in Mexico. Um, and he just talks about the experience. This is not all the stuff, OG, all the great stuff that you said, the the resources, but just uh, shares a lot of a lot of tips, and um, we had him on a show maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and super interesting hearing it from somebody who's been there. But when it comes to this type of stuff as well, a guy who did exactly what Paul's talking about, Jim White, who also was on one of our roundtables, uh, Jim 
retired at 54, left his IT job and moved uh, out of the country, writes a lot uh, for people out of the country. We will link to Jim White and uh, Travis Scott Luther on our show notes page. And then, you know what, Brooke will dive into this in the 201 in our newsletter, even more with even more resources. That Travis Scott guy, he's like a crossover artist. I mean, he had a whole meal named after him at McDonald's last year. I think he's put out some albums. That's a talented dude. There's Travis Scott and there's Travis Scott Luther. Yes. Oh, I thought you said Travis Scott, the Lutheran, like that was his (laughs) faith or something. Yeah. Oh, that's it. I should listen more closely. Hold to to, to slightly different people, but both charming gentlemen in their own (laughs) right. Uh, Hey guys, just a couple things here uh, to tie up loose ends. Talk about our community. If you're here for surround sound, there's a bunch of ways that we help you out. Our friend Gertrude manages all of our social accounts. Stop by and say hi, whether it's on Instagram, Twitter, in our Facebook group, the basement, all kinds of ways, of course, that you can get more information. And we talk about how important it is to be around like-minded individuals. We have all those for you, but if you're not here for surround sound, you're concerned about the market and the chatter about a recession on the horizon. OG and his team have put together a free guide, shares eight moves to make in a down market. It's a guide that'll help you plan more, panic less, no matter what the market does. So head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide at stackybenjamins.com slash guide, and you'll get this helpful free guide from OG. That's going to do it for today. Man, what a great show. Big thanks to a lot of people. But Doug, before all that, what should we have learned today, man? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Ramit Sadie. Your richest life, finding it, begins with imagining something bigger and ends with plotting a pretty simple path toward it. Get moving, stacker. Second, follow the lead of Best Buy. What is your inventory level? Are you controlling the things that you can control or complaining about things you can't do anything about? Focus on your own activities and you'll get ahead much more quickly. But the big lesson... I know Joe's mom fooled me 20 minutes ago with the whole separating colors so I do her laundry, but never let someone fool you twice. Don't let Joe's mom tell you that there's this thing called a Michelin star restaurant. She wants to pay. Ha! Everyone knows Michelin's a tire brand lady. I can see that coming from a mile away. You're not fooling this guy. Thanks to Ramit Sadie for joining us today. You'll find his I Will Teach You To Be Rich workbook wherever you purchase workbooks. You know what? Because I know about Covey's fourth secret circle of service, I'm going to help you out, and I'll tell the team to also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Hey, Ma, me loaf, and put a link in there. We finally went to see a movie that's uh, leaving theaters. Not not a ton out right now, gentlemen. Not a ton. So we went to see this action movie. There's still movie. movies in theaters? I know, right? A uh, little action movie featuring a guy you might have heard of <laughs> named Brad Pitt. You guys familiar with Brad Pitt? Sounds like a hack. Hi. There's a gun on Shrug. It's the quiet car. Can't use your small inside voice in here, son. There's a gun. Talk 
to me. I am ready. You are getting the new and improved me. Because if you put peace out in the world, you get peace back. I think you might be forgetting what you do for a living. Take the gun. Every job I do, somebody dies. I'm not that guy anymore. Some conflicts require a gun. Hey, this is nice. That's the sound of Brad Pitt getting aboard the bullet train, which is the name of this film. And you can hear him getting ready to get on the train earlier there, talking to his handler about how he's turned over a new leaf. Somebody dies all the time. And, oh, gee, he's just going to put some beauty out in the world. He's going to put more peace because if you give good stuff, good stuff comes back to you. And he's he's tired of all this negativity. Just tired of it. As a hitman, he's very tired of it. It's a little sounds like the same theme as um, Barry. No, the um, hit wife's bodyguard or whatever. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This kind of this same theme. This movie when I first saw this this trailer, you know, and I heard the uh, I heard the Japanese version there of the Beatles staying alive, and uh, and I thought, oh, this just seems Wait, really did- dumb. And then I. Heard a review. Did you just say, wait a minute, hold please. Did you just say the Beatles staying alive? Did I say the Beatles? You absolutely I, I, did. You <laughs> lost all credibility. There it goes. Oh, because I don't know the Bee Gees? Really? Well, Cause because I, <laughs> cause you thought, that, and yes. I'm not even a giant Beatles fan, but they made way the hell better music than, ha, 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 staying alive. I thought, I thought you were talking about the opposite, that I don't know the Bee Gees as well as I should. But uh, yeah, I don't know that anybody should know them that well. Uh, Move along. Go back to the train. Taking the says the Barry Manilow fan. Like what? Did, just he's <laughs> he's just <laughs> he's all a over natural the place, showman. People. Yes, he's all over the place. Uh, so I thought, what a dumb movie. And you know what, guys? This is a dumb movie that is so well written and so tight and so funny and the action sequences you know i got really tired in the in the latest marvel movie because of the fact that all these action sequences i i yawn and i'm so bored because i just don't care i just you know they're gonna have some really cool bam boo whatever going and stuff going all over the place no there's some serious stakes whenever these guys start uh, start beating on each other, which at the beginning of that clip, you heard them talking about the quiet car. And when they have the, when they have a fight in the quiet car, it's hilarious. When they have a fight in the cafe car, it's also uh, uh, pretty funny. One guy in the fight makes the other guy buy him some fizzy water while they're, while they're fighting. It is weird. It is uh, awful. It's, uh, yeah, at some points it's 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 eye roll and it's so freaking fun. It is so good. It is so 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 wow. good. It was everything I wanted in a movie. Like wow. uh, OG, you got your explosions. Set the bar high. You got your explosions. You're gonna laugh all the way through it. The uh, everything I want in a movie. All right. It is it is everything you in particular want in a movie. I I. I really enjoyed this. This is not going to win an Oscar. This is Anything not going to be time. down in the, this is, this is much more like what's the movie where Sandra Bullock and uh, what's his name are on the bus speed. Is that speed. what it, it was called? Speed. Th- th- this movie in some ways is like speed where there's this frenetic fate, but there's this frenetic pace there. The movie never lets you really take a, take a breath. The, uh, it's funny. It's engaging. Wow. But, you know, so, it's not Steel Magnolias we're watching here. A couple of weeks ago, I saw a review, and the guy who wrote it said, this is quite possibly the worst movie ever created. <laughs> and at that time, uh, it was it had like a zero, what, whatever Rotten Tomatoes zero worst ever is, that, that's what it was. So as you were bringing it up, I thought, okay, it's been a little while. Let's, let's go to Rotten Tomatoes, didn't know how to get to it. So I start to Google Rotten. Before I can finish typing the word rotten, it comes up Rotten Tomatoes Bullet Train. Like that's the <laughs> that, that's how big a search term this has become. And uh, I we're up to two stars now. So it's gotten a little better. Still not a resounding gotta go see it. I've got a seven 50. and a half I got a seven and a half on IMDB. I got a fifty three percent rotten tomatoes. Um it's yeah, moving I up. mean it, you know, I agree with. Uh, I heard a review by the guys on Film Spotting, which is a which is a fantastic movie. 
um, review podcast. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to that for a number of years, and these guys have some of the biggest film critics on, and they resoundingly love this movie, and and I would tend to agree with them. It is it is it is very tight. I agree with the critics, the snobby critics that go, oh well, this is not whatever. No, no, there's no subplot, there's no existential <laughs> crap going on. There's there is funny stuff and serious fighting and a satisfying ending. All I want. What That's, do I want when I go to a an action movie, right? What do I want? Yeah. It's funny you bring that those two different ratings up because I have a friend who will only look at the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes and I only look at the critic score. And and he he wants that fun roller coaster ride. He just wants the fun ride in movies and I want to be you know how you know how sort of esoteric and what a thinker I am. So I want I want to be challenged oh a little bit more. Oh boy. OG on that note, I think it's time to deeper, deeper taller boots. Get so. deep. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna go get my taller boots out. <laughs> <laughs>